Today's episode is sponsored by the Filmmakers Podcast. Hello and welcome to Film Pro Productivity, the podcast that helps film professionals and other creative people to live a more focused, effective and happy life. My name is Carter Ferguson and this is episode 47, Bullying and the Silent Majority. Today I'll be tackling a form of behaviour which I sadly see more and more often and it took me a number of years to realise that these sort of people, bullies, are as much a part of adult life as they probably ever were at school. But I've had enough of them now and I've started calling them out when they raise their ugly heads. They don't like it though. They don't like it at all. In last week's show we had a mailbag episode, at least I hope we had a mailbag episode because this show is actually being recorded just a few days after the first episode of season 3 has launched. I have had the busiest September with fight work that I think I've had in the last 10 years and I'm a little bit behind with my recordings but I am catching up very, very rapidly. But this is a pre-recorded show. I've actually recorded, in fact, this show once before, listened back to it and thought I could do better. So I've reworked what I'm trying to say here and I think to do the subject justice I had to expand on it a little bit more. So today's episode is actually going to be the longest episode which I've ever recorded. So you can look back to last week's episode, I'm sure it's absolutely awesome, but at the moment of recording I can't actually tell you what really is involved in it. Today though, hang on to your seats as we talk about bullies and the silent majority. Eleanor Roosevelt once said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And as I sit and think of examples for this show, I find that only a few of these hurts that I've had in the past still linger painfully on my consciousness. The majority of the bullying experiences that I have been the victim of over the years have actually been put to rest. I read about something on Google yesterday morning called sad fishing, (laughs) which is when people go onto social media to say, oh, poor me, and tell a story or say something to try and get a response back of sympathy. That's obviously not why I'm putting these stories out there. They are demonstrative of the bullying which can take place and the experiences that I've had myself and I do not look for pity in recounting them. As I said a second ago, in actual fact, most of the feelings I have towards these situations have been very much put to rest. Instead though, I offer them up here as examples, warnings if you may, of what you should be looking out for in life and in work and later on I'll even be talking about how it isn't actually that easy sometimes to spot a bully or bullying behaviour. Nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. Abraham Lincoln, unquote. I'll kick this off by talking about assistant directors. Not all of them, just some of them. Calm down, calm down. And for those of you listeners that are not in the business, the film business, television business, whatever, These are the people who manage the on-set dealings on a film, basically. They are the managers who lead and drive the productions forward by, you know, calling the shots, making it work. They they help the director by keeping an eye on their watch and driving the production forward. And most of the firsts, first ADs that I work with are very good people. They are focused in their work and they run a safe and happy ship with a happy cast and crew. But it's a ship that runs at a fast and driven creative pace that ensures it meets a planned production schedule. But there are those amongst that breed, though, who use things like game-playing and sarcasm and, in reality, bullying to meet the same fast and driven schedule. And there's one AD that comes to mind that treated me in a way that they would never get away with now, as today... I'd be sure to set them straight if they tried it. I'd been working as a fight director on a feature and one day I was given a background artist who was monumentally miscast and really totally unable to perform in a fight 
with any level of competence. Uh, it was the sort of chap that maybe thought he was going to turn up and just walk across the back of shot, and he ended up getting put in a costume and asked to do a fairly complicated fight sequence. And as I was working with him, I knew we were in trouble because he just wasn't able to deliver. Now, I'm good at what I do, but I am not a miracle worker. One thing I learned very early on doing the fights is you cannot get up there and do it for them. And in this film... I was just not given the support I needed by the assistant director. And the way that that first assistant director spoke to me that day when he saw this poor guy try and perform was utterly unforgivable. He blamed me for this guy not being good enough. He spoke to me like some sort of lower life form. And do you know what? He treated me like crap for the whole production. One day he even left me behind at a location in the middle of nowhere with a crash mat so huge that it actually needed a truck to move. And if it wasn't for a junior producer who I respect greatly and has now become quite a successful producer in his own right, I might still be standing there in that car park wondering what to do. We had to, in the end, squash it into the last vehicle that was left except us, the honey wagon or toilet truck as you might know it, in order to get it to the next location. To say I was upset that day is an understatement. These days, I like to know who the first AD is on a production before I'll even agree to work on it, as I've got a list of horrible first ADs now that I try to avoid. It's a very short list, but that guy is right at the top of it. Next today are the actors. Now, again, not all actors, I hasten to add. I've got a lot of friends who are actors. I was an actor myself. Not all actors, but there are needy actors that like to drop me in it for no other reason than they are seeking attention. And a typical example of this would be this situation uh, when those who some way into the filming of a fight scene which I've been working on and I've carefully worked out with them and on which after each and every take I have checked to ensure that they are happy and safe and unhurt and they in turn have given me the affirmative that all is well to my surprise, suddenly announce that they are actually finding it very tough and are struggling on despite the pain when someone else in the production, for example, a first AD or a producer, asks them how they're getting on. I really, really hate it when this happens, and it happens all the time. This is really just attention-seeking, of course, but it has a side effect of placing me in a bad position and, in effect, threatens my future re-employment, but it is a form of bullying nonetheless. On another feature, I was working as both fight director and second unit director when I picked up an incredibly painful injury called shin splints whilst I was rehearsing fights pre-shoot in a cold, cold warehouse environment. On this picture, there was a makeup guy who had a very egotistic personality, and he decided not for a laugh particularly, but really out of sheer badness, to move my chair away from the secondary monitors whilst I had briefly stepped onto set. And I'm up and down a lot during these things, and it was quite a painful experience for me doing that because of the injury that I had in my legs. And when I returned from the set, I found that my chair had gone, and the space in which it had sat was now filled with other people from other departments, costume and makeup, etc., And I heard giggles from that group. And I have to say, I was totally baffled by the behaviour. I hadn't seen anything so overtly bullyish since I was a child. And here it was in a so-called professional environment. And at the time, I let it go, as I wasn't exactly sure who had done it. But the incident was really quite upsetting and very unnerving to me, as I'm a genuinely hard worker with a pleasant professional demeanour. And I'd done nothing wrong. I was injured and I found myself to be the butt of some evil joke with no great explanation. I was genuinely, and I still am, taken aback by the disrespect which I was shown. And one thing I've noted over the years, incidentally, is that some people read my pleasant, professional and relaxed manner as a sign of weakness, and on occasion I have had to kind of strengthen my resolve to something more authoritative when dealing with certain types of people still remaining professional, of course. Here I found myself being put through extreme pain, seemingly for the pleasure of this bullish makeup guy and his cronies, all over, seemingly over, the real estate space my chair had been taking up next to the monitors. 
And all this didn't change the fact too that it was utterly essential for safety and directorial reasons that I can actually see a monitor. I found myself injured and in pain having to stand at the back and look over these fools to view the monitors, to view the fights. After this happened, as you might expect by the way, I never ever sat with them again. A more subtle form of bullying behaviour which I've experienced a significant number of times and another key reason why I finally gave up producing and directing films comes from what I call the sideliner and I've talked about this form of toxic behaviour in the past and mostly happened to me anyway at producer and director level. A sideliner is a person that you are collaborating with who starts to shut you out of communications usually because they pertain to money or ownership of a piece of creative work despite it being essential and correct that you are included in those communications. If this starts to happen to you let me tell you one thing that I have learned from hard-won experience. You're being scammed. You're either being scammed out of credit for the work or out of money or both and you can guarantee you're being talked about in a negative light in some way. If there's one thing in fact that's happened to me all too recently that really gets my goat, really annoys me, it's people that I've been working with tricking others that they're communicating with into believing that they are speaking with my voice my thoughts and my opinions when the reality is that I've been shut out of communications, I have no idea what is getting said one way or the other and they have gained credibility for that particular production through my CV, through my credibility and through my reputation. Bullying builds character like nuclear waste creates superheroes. It's a rare occurrence and often does more damage than good. Zach W. Van, unquote. I've not been physically threatened very often, that's just not the sort of behaviour I come across, but I know a crew member who was physically threatened on an independent picture quite recently. The bully in this case had made an incorrect assumption about that crew member and they went barreling after the innocent party, cornered them and gave them a ton of threatening abuse about what the bully believed had been disrespect or an uncaring attitude towards his team. Now this is something I do come across. There are people out there who, despite not having a clue, count themselves experts on many things and decide to give you their opinion on whatever it is that you're doing. This guy though took it even further than that. It reads to me that the bully was actually trying to show off perhaps to other crew members by confronting an innocent and trying to frame them for a crime they effectively didn't commit or didn't even know about. Disappointingly for the bully who was of the large muscly variety, the victim in this case, a consummate professional, just calmly explained that his assumption was wrong. In turn, this self-appointed writer of some imagined wrong took it as far as he could, even with a producer witnessing it, until the victim, and I use the word with a certain sense of irony, as they were in fact a martial arts expert of very high standing, and he didn't know this of course, finally took the bully up on his offer to fight. The bully, as you might expect in a bullying story like this, suddenly had a change of heart, backed down and slinked off. I'll come back to all of these incidents later in the episode as this is not the end of the story or the lesson. When one person makes an accusation, check to be sure he himself is not the guilty one. Sometimes it is those whose case is weak who make the most clamour. Piers Anthony, unquote. It's not always easy to identify bullying as it can start out quite subtly and quietly. A bully will assess just how far they can go and even kind of befriend you or trying to win your trust in the first place before turning around and targeting you. They may only turn on you, in fact, when they realise that their beliefs or passions or attitudes or religion or whatever are not the same as your own and it may at first be disguised in chit-chat or sarcasm and be quite difficult to spot. Elsewhere, what you might read as bullying might not be. When bad behaviour is pointed out to some people, they may actually be profusely sorry. Maybe they've been having a bad day or they have trouble at home. And I can certainly recall times 
I've been shorter than I would have liked to have been with people because I was worried about something that was going on in my private life. So remember the old adage, be kind for everyone else is fighting battles that you likely do not know about. Some people too just have large or loud or brash personalities and may not intend their actions or words to be hurtful. I think what I'm saying here is that it's complicated. Seemingly bad behaviour is not always intentionally bullying, but unintentional bad behaviour can still affect others in a negative way. And I'm kind of pussyfooting around another bullying territory here where some people have refined their character of victim to such an art form that they themselves have become the bully and lie in wait, ready to be offended and victimised. I'll come back round to these kind of horrors in a bit as it's kind of interesting and I'll be using the term snowflake to capture this particular type of bully but I don't intend to offend you with its use unless you really want to be offended, of course, yourself. <laughs> and I'm sure you know what it is, but a snowflake is regarded as a piece of derogatory slang, a term for a person implying that they have an inflated sense of uniqueness, an unwarranted sense of entitlement or are overly emotional easily offended and unable to deal with opposing opinions. I'll be using the term snowflake to identify a bully who is so easily offended and ready to complain or play the victim card as to be classified a bully themselves. Michael J. Fox said, One's dignity may be assaulted, vandalised and cruelly mocked, but it can never be taken away unless it is surrendered. So what more easily identifiable types of bullying are there? Well, it can include being yelled at, as you could probably imagine, which I've seen happen a good few times in professional life. But I've also seen the opposite, in fact, people being accused of shouting when they are not. I've seen people being needled, sidelined or gaslighted by true bullies to the point where they are exasperated and kick off in frustration. Then, in turn, they get unfairly accused of bullying while the instigator smiles quietly to themselves. Eye-rolling is a small annoyance, but I think one worth mentioning. Eye-rolling drifts into the area of bullying when it is used to undermine someone either quietly behind their backs for the benefit of others or directly to put them off inferring, here we go again, or some other rudeness. I was once in a meeting, an early meeting with a first AD for a feature film, and when it ended, I was told by my assistant that the third AD, who was also in the room, was eye-rolling behind my back as I talked about avoiding a few particularly dangerous extras, supporting artists that tend to get attracted to low-budget action films that have guns and stuff in them. Yes, that's the sort of thing I, I talk about in meeting. It's important. That's all I'm saying. Anyway, I never pulled her up about it. But do you know what happened? On the very first day, the very first day of filming, that third AD that was rolling her eyes at what I was saying put one of the three extras I had asked her to avoid onto the set with me. I couldn't fucking believe it. And I don't think she did it deliberately to wind me up, by the way. I just think she didn't listen to a word that was said. She already knew it all. But as a, as a great example of why eye-rolling is a problem, I'm recounting that story here because it was... Absolutely incredible. I'm not one to be afraid of a bit of research and a quick Google search has thrown up a few more examples of workplace bullying for you. There's obviously verbal abuse, not necessarily shouting, things like telling people they're useless or unreliable or stupid or being talked down to like what happened to me in my first example. Ill treatment such as ostracism or being sent to Coventry, as it's known, is another form of bullying. And I actually ha had this happen to me fairly recently, and I'll talk about it a little bit later on. Being constantly criticised, having duties and responsibilities taken away without good reason, that's another form of bullying, and that's a another one I can tick off. I've experienced that. Shouting, aggressive behaviour or threats on occasion, yes, that's happened to me. Being put down or made to feel the butt of jokes, yes, tick that one too. Being persistently picked on in front of others or in, in private, yeah, well, I've, I don't get that so much these days. I have in the past. These days I've developed like an, an air of supreme indifference to this sort of thing, so they don't usually bother me too much. If they try it, they get bored and move away. 
being constantly ignored, victimised or excluded. Yes, that's very annoying. Big tick on that one. Constantly mocking and attacking. Yes. Spreading malicious rumours. Yes. Yes. Misuse of power or position to make someone feel uncomfortable or victimised. Yep. Very prevalent in my experience. Making threats about job security. Absolutely. Blocking promotion or progress within the workplace I'm, I'm sure it happens progress within the industry is near impossible at the best of times though so i can't think of an example off the bat but i'm absolutely certain it happens and cyber bullying should probably be mentioned it's a whole other thing but it can't really be ignored i went through a couple of years where my website and my email were attacked again and again possibly probably by bots now that i think back that had found a weakness in my website's structure or my email address, which at that point was easily found online. Or maybe it was just a troll with nothing better to do. And for the record, I solved this problem by moving my site away from the WordPress structure. And it's actually hosted on Wix at the moment, which has got its own limitations, but didn't doesn't seem to have the same number of attacks as, as the site had on, on the WordPress format, and also by changing my email host from, I don't know who it was I was paying to host my standard email address, which for the record is carter at fightdirector.com, but I, I actually get that hosted now through Gmail, uh, so it's actually technically a Gmail address, and what's brilliant with that is you pay something like £2 a month, might be a little bit less than that in fact, and it stops literally all spam, I don't get any spam, I don't get any phishing seemingly it gets 99.9% .9 of the stuff coming through but all that said the move to make my online stuff secure was a bit of a drag nonetheless kind of want to come back to this topic of snowflakes that I mentioned earlier on or what I'm referring to as snowflakes because there's quite a lot of interesting information online about this and there's an article in psychology today that talks about how instead of learning to grapple with viewpoints that diverge from their own, students are now learning the twin habits of defensive censorship and vindictive protectiveness. I'll say that again. Defensive self-censorship and vindictive protectiveness. In other words, they pretty quickly grasp which views are permitted and which are not and they learn to conform. When they disagree with accepted opinions, they know to keep quiet because others who hold accepted views will thoroughly lambast anyone who dares speak up. This is an incredible snapshot, I think, of modern society, not just of students. I've certainly seen this sort of behaviour many times in the film industry. I'm trying to keep this show adult, but the article is a fascinating read. It says that in school, good children, good in inverted commas, learn that they can get away with mean-spirited behaviour like name-calling and social exclusion as long as there is unspoken peer agreement regarding which children are acceptable targets. And those targets, by the way, are typically the unconventional, non-conformist, different kids and sadly, for those creatives listening to this show, that probably means us, by the way. And these unspoken peer agreements, of course, in school or in adult professional life, make it more difficult and certainly more high risk for us to call out bullies. Judge Judy made a kind of interesting point that's sort of on theme here. She says, in too many ways, political correctness has been a bully. I'll leave you thinking about that one. It's not right for this episode for me to expand upon it i've got to move on but it's an interesting thought in too many ways political correctness has been a bully bullying can build to the point where you dread going to work and where your home life is affected i can't explain to you the misery that i was put through on a regional theater show that i was cast in when i was an actor and just starting out Another actor in the production used to needle me and give me notes at every opportunity. That's something actors don't shouldn't do to each other because it unnerves them. And they got me so worked up about a certain scene that I was in that required our joint timing in it that I dreaded not only that scene, but going into the theatre at all. 
I was stuck there though, as there isn't an option for an actor to drop out of something like this without causing a whole lot of trouble. So I suffered it, and it was a miserable, miserable time for me. Years later, incidentally, that actor that troubled me, that bullied me, he came and apologised to me, which was a very interesting and welcome turn of events, and I respect him greatly for that. Another form of bullying that I've experienced, although it may be regarded as just bad behaviour by most, is that of being used as a prop for someone else's ego. I was once hired to work on a show which had a lot of background reenactor fighting extras in it, but I wasn't hired as the fight director, I was hired as the safety advisor instead because these guys tend to do their own thing and I was really happy to fulfil that role. The, the reenactors were brilliant fun to work with and they were excellent at what they did. Now, at the risk of sounding like this though is a promo for my own fight work, I have to say that I am really, really good at what I do. I'm extremely experienced, stupidly good with a sword, and beyond that, I'm really, really fast, fast at working. I was only on this show for a day, and on a few rare occasions, I did find that to keep things safe, I had to intercede very politely and quickly. But the director, who, as it turns out, really didn't want me there in the first place, it became very, very clear, he pulled me aside early on and told me that he didn't have time for my intervention. The thing is, though, he only pulled me aside about five or six feet away from the others, the other 20 people standing there. So this ensured that everyone, cast and crew, heard him, in effect, telling me off. And as he rushed back to do his far more important work than than mine, I had to announce quite loudly, in fact, that whether he had time for me or not, I was going to go right ahead, ensuring that we do it all in a safe way anyway. Now, he didn't say two words to me for the rest of the day, but nobody got hurt, and the number of background artists that came up to me and thanked me at the end of that day for my help in keeping them safe was very, very significant. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that I don't think on any other fight in 24 years I've had so many people come up and thank me on any other production. The reenactors were clearly very happy that I was there to keep them safe. About halfway through the day, the producer came on set and I spoke to him about the incident as I was a wee bit unnerved. He simply said to me that I wasn't there to be liked and I couldn't really disagree with him, so I went along with it. I'm just not in the habit of making enemies and... I was left that day slightly dissatisfied because I hadn't been able to win over the director. But as I think back, I don't think I ever could have won him over. I think I'd been forced upon him. He'd done things like this in the past without me and he thought I was somehow there to restrict him. He didn't see me as an asset. He saw me as a problem and I don't think there was ever going to be a way past it. It's a shame because I really love doing these kind of docudramas and that was a for me an enjoyable day despite the problems. So how do we begin to combat this? What do you do if you're being bullied? Most of the advice that I've found online says that in the first instance you should seek to solve your problem informally. If you feel safe and comfortable speaking to them that is. Informing them that you will be taking a more official route if they don't change their behaviour might just be enough to stop their attack. And Michael Caine talks about this, or he kind of talks about it in reverse, and I've been looking for the exact quote, but I haven't discovered it yet and I've got to record this episode. He was talking about working with a director who he'd heard was known for shouting at his actors. And before he started the film, he said to the director, I hear that you like to shout at people. I don't like being shouted at. And he says, you know, that director, he never shouted at me once in that film. And maybe that director was a bully and maybe he wasn't, but Michael Caine short-circuited any opportunity for bullying before it even started. For many, the informal way isn't an option though. So if this is the case for you, you should make management, if you have management, aware of what's happening. And if you still are not satisfied that the harassment has stopped, if it is not taken seriously by your line manager, or if the problem gets worse, you should seek to make an official complaint, or if you have one, take it to your union. Amy Cooper Hakim of Psychology Today says, be confident and use simple, unemotional language. She says, bullies lose their power if you don't cower. Deep down, they doubt they deserve your respect, 
they admire you for speaking with self-assurance and confidence. So when they bombard, don't counterpunch. Rather, win them over with your strong, firm, courteous demeanour. And she says, let them know that this potential victim does not intend to be victimised. It does not seek forgiveness, but does not pose a challenge either. I tried this approach once when a bullying behaviour came towards me kind of out of nowhere. And it's kind of funny. <laughs> it's kind of funny because the bully became so enraged by my calm response and presentation of the facts that it makes me laugh even now. You see, I'd caught them with their hand in the proverbial cookie jar and their rage back at me was, in effect, staged to hide their embarrassment and humiliation at being caught out. Kind of interesting. Sign Whitson says, Stay connected. Bullies operate by making their victims feel alone and powerless and isolated. So you should keep people informed of your situation. It will also, incidentally, alleviate your stress about the matter when you share your problem and gain an ally. Psychology Today also recommends that we set limits, and that is exactly what Michael Caine did in that earlier example. Chrissy Skavik writes, The trick is to remain polite and professional whilst still setting your limits firmly. Don't let the bully get under your skin. That's what he wants. Practice your response so you're prepared the next time something happens and you can respond swiftly without getting emotional. Keep it simple and straightforward with something like, I won't be talked to in this way. Sign Whitson further recommends that we act quickly and consistently. The longer a bully has power over a victim, she says, the stronger the hold becomes. Oftentimes bullying begins in a relatively mild form, name-calling, teasing or minor physical aggression. After the bully has tested the waters and confirmed that a victim is not going to tell anyone or stand up for their rights, that aggression will worsen. The final piece of advice that's offered by psychology today is that perhaps all you have to do is wait a little while and it says strike while the iron is cold. So rather than exchanging hostilities, step back so that you are not responding in the heat of the moment and meeting them on their own level. Cool heads find solutions more easily than hot ones. Besides, if you step back, they may do the dirty work for you. And another thing that all of the articles I looked at had in common was that you mustn't see yourself as the problem. Nobody can hurt me without my permission, said Mahatma Gandhi. And he also said that bullies are always to be found where there are cowards, by the way. One article says that the reason people experience bullying is not because of their sexuality, gender identity, race, appearance, disability or any other unique factor. It is because of the bully's attitude towards that factor. The only thing possible to change is attitudes. And I say that the person who is bullying you is the one with the issue, not you. It's just the way things are. You don't have to give yourself the additional burden of trying to change them. Let's look back now over the situations that I have previously outlined and by using Napoleon Hill's method of accurate thought, let's try and figure out why they occurred and how we can protect ourselves and others from it in future. The first AD who talked down to me is a fairly regularly employed uh, guy for one very clear reason. He brings productions in on time and that, in the end, seems to be all that really matters to many production companies. And the production company who put the film together, to be fair, may never have even heard about my mistreatment or the mistreatment of others. And why not? Because I let it go. I, I, I continued to work on in fear, my keenness, especially in my younger days, to make an impression and drive things on meant that making a formal complaint was not an option because I wanted to keep my job. I'm 100% certain, in fact, that at the time, if I had reported a grievance, that it would have been me that got dropped from the production and not the bully who was running the show. In hindsight, what I should have done was to confront the bully right then, just as Michael Caine did, and set out my limits, set out my stall, as they say. 
I should have explained that talking to me in the way that he did, dismissing my experience and my qualifications and placing me in situations in which I had absolutely no support was not and never would be acceptable. If I had done that, perhaps that would have worked, perhaps not. What I can certainly say is that if I had done that, I would feel better about the experience now looking back. (laughs) But let's look at another situation, the actors that like to drop me in it. Actors often don't get taken to task over bullying behaviour as the aim of everyone on any given production is to keep things moving and shoot what's on the call sheet. Or if it's a longer shoot and they are a main character, playing a main character, they may kind of get away with it, very likely with a talking to along the way from a producer until they leave the production The last thing that we want to do on a busy shoot day is upset an actor that has important scenes coming up and 99 times out of 100, replacing them is just not an option. Much of the time, therefore, a bullish actor is allowed to behave badly, for a time at least, for the sake of peace of everyone else, the saving of budget and for the sake of the show. Over time, though, what I've discovered is that an actor that does this will be playing other games with other people and their reputation will surely dive. This sort of trouble bothers me less than it used to as I mostly work with really very awesome and very professional people these days. And although actors, the actors of which I speak, might not know it, and you should know this now if you are one, Causing upset and trouble or playing games or bullying other actors or crew inevitably leads you to one thing and that is being dropped sooner or later from the productions that you're working on or finding that unemployment occurs more often than it used to. What goes around comes around, remember. A situation happened to me once with an actor who thought he'd give his opinion very loudly about a fight scene that I'd directed. As it was quite early on in my career, it it did bother me and I spoke to my line manager about it, who happened to be the producer, and he said this to me. He said, ignore him, he's a wee dick. And in one stroke, this both calmed and reassured me. Because unbeknownst to me, everyone already knew how difficult that actor could be. The act of complaining about me was like water off a duck's back to the producer, as this guy had cried wolf so many times before. He was known for his power plays, especially with bit part actors or crew who were on on dailies. And my reputation, in fact, remained untarnished. Martin Luther King once said, In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And this quote, this particular quote, represents my greatest revelation about bullying in recent years. I can attest that now I remember the inaction of my friends and colleagues with far greater clarity than the actions of the bullies themselves. It possibly doesn't sound it, but the bully that moved my chair, that incident was one of the more troubling ones that I recounted. This guy was an ass of the highest order. But I've noted one thing over the years, that if people have talent or some other redeeming feature in the eyes of the producers, they are often left to behave in the worst ways. Personally, if I'd been in the group when someone did this with my chair for sheer badness, I would have spoken up, but not one of these other people did. And why didn't they? Well, I'd put my money on peer pressure. They were scared to go against him for fear of being targeted themselves. It was a very poor show by my colleagues that day, but I'm happy to report that through the grapevine I've heard that Karma finally caught up with that guy on another production. I think he moved someone else's chair who wasn't so forgiving as I was. (laughs) Finally, I want to revisit the situation that happened to that crew member who was physically threatened. Unfortunately, they decided to walk away from that production as the immediate stance that the producers took was not to fire the bully, but to let it pass, try and gloss over it. I think that there was some noise created by those in his department, which sounds something along the line of, if he goes, I go, effectively putting the producers in a tight situation. 
From what I can gather, though, by the very act of walking off of the production, this brought about a number of fresh bullying complaints by other crew members about the same guy. I get that the producers found themselves in a tricky situation, and I have wondered how I would have handled it myself. But as this is a retrospective, I'll say that I understand what they did, but I disagree with how they handled it. For me, having a producer who witnessed the physical threatening behaviour of one crew member to another, there was only one way to deal with it, and that was to fire the bully. They didn't, and this has had repercussions, believe it or not, beyond that production. I'm also sure that their inaction would have unnerved and caused upset right across their own production as word went round that this sort of bullying behaviour had been let to pass. If they had stood their ground and not allowed themselves to be blackmailed by that department, the film would have continued with a slight hiatus with different people in the roles and I believe a happier and healthier and I'd argue a better production to show for it. They broke the golden rule of success when they let behaviour like this pass. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Martin Luther King Jr. Unquote. If you're a producer, I think it would be time well spent if you ensured that you have an anti-bullying policy developed for your productions or that you build it into your contracts from now on. Now, I've got to wrap this up, but before I do, I must go back to the situation where I found myself being sidelined, and which led to a very aggressive bullying attempt by someone that, to be honest, I had always known was difficult. This was a situation where I really expected others to step up and help me, but I can only conclude that they didn't want to put their head above the proverbial parapet for fear of being targeted themselves. And by doing so, they chose to stand by and let me be abused. While a known bully is targeting one person you see, it means that they are not targeting someone else, and the others in the group feel safe. It's a very sad and disappointing observation, but I believe that this was what was in play. In the long run, of course, the bully will turn on them. And finally, they too will realise that the time has come to stand their ground or depart. Desmond Tutu said, If you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you say that you are neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. I was the mouse in the situations I listed before and would have appreciated the help of a bystander if it had been offered. And if I was ever a neutral in the past, I am determined not to stand by and let a bully get away with this sort of thing anymore. The bully has a Jekyll and Hyde nature. It's vile, vicious and vindictive in private, but innocent and charming in front of witnesses. No one can or wants to believe this individual has a vindictive nature. Only the current target of the serial bully's aggression sees both sides, whilst the Jekyll side is described as charming and convincing enough to deceive personnel, management and a tribunal. The Hyde side is frequently described as evil. Hyde is the real person, though. Jekyll is an act. Tim Field, unquote. Now, I did warn you at the start that this was a big episode and I only have a little bit further to go I think it would be doing you a disservice if I didn't take this just one beat further. So hang on for another few minutes and listen up because there are complicating factors in talking about bullies that I must mention. Issues raised when confronting bullies can be followed by counter allegations of ill treatment and unfairness and allegations of bullying will often follow on from disciplinary or grievance procedures. So when you call out a bully, they may well instigate some form of tit-for-tat response and you need to be prepared for this. To protect yourself, you should document any incident of harassment in detail and include the date, times, place, who was involved, 
what happened and the names of any witnesses. And I use the call recorder app on my phone to help me out in difficult situations like this that may come up on the telephone, for example. If you haven't heard the episode yet, then look back to episode 27, five more free apps to make you more productive to find out more about that particular app. Bullies melt like the Wicked Witch of the North, you see, when faced with facts and figures. And if you have them, you will always come out on top. My pain may be the reason for someone's laugh, but my laugh must never be the reason for someone's pain. Charlie Chaplin, unquote. Your call to action today is simple. If you witness bullying, step in and help. Remember the words of Martin Luther King Jr. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And if you are being bullied at the moment, then use the tips that I have listed here to get back control. Hopefully others will step in and help you, but if not, then set limits, act quickly and consistently and call them out, be confident and use simple, unemotional language, and if that isn't an option, document the happenings, tell others of your plight, and strike while the iron is cold. Cool heads, remember, find solutions more easily than hot ones. So bullies are bullish by nature and need to be called out. This doesn't mean that they will stop their inherent bullying tendencies, but they will know that if they try it, that they're not going to get away with it. This has been a hell of a long episode, but I couldn't let another series pass without going into this topic, and once I started, I knew I couldn't do it by halves. I want to thank everyone that's spoken to me about their experiences lately and all of the awesome production people too that have supported me over the years. I've worked and continue to work with some truly amazing producers, production personnel and production companies and first ADs etc who really care about how things are done and how people are treated and not just because they're ticking a box in insurance either. I'm lucky to have been working for many years too with the BBC who are all over any form of bullying and I'm eternally grateful too for the help I have found there over the years. And I'm also thankful to British Actors Equity, to Bektu and BAPAM for being there whenever I need them and I have needed them. I'd also like to thank Giles Alderson of the Filmmakers Podcast for sponsoring this episode. His show is absolutely fantastic, so get over there and get subscribing. I attached the Filmmakers Podcast to this particular episode because this is an important topic and I felt that the association would be a good one. I've got links to many of the references that I made in the show notes and you can find them on the official site in full. I've got a feeling, well, I've not got a feeling, I know that these show notes in entirety will not transfer onto the apps that you're using maybe one or two of them might include it but generally speaking they'll probably get cut short because i'm sure there's a character limit and what i try to do is more or less do a transcript of the full episodes in the show notes if you want to be sure to get the full transcript you need to go to the official website filmproproductivity.com click on the episode and you will get the full transcript of the show i'll end today with the words of abraham lincoln I would rather be a little nobody than to be an evil somebody. Now take control of your own destiny. Stand up to bullies. Keep on shooting. And join me next time on Film Pro Productivity. The music that you can hear right now is Adventures by Ehimitsu. You can view the show notes for this episode on the official website at filmpoolproductivity.com. You can follow my personal account on Twitter and Instagram at fight underscore director or follow the show's official Twitter account at filmproprodpod or official Facebook account at filmproproductivity. Please support this show by subscribing, spreading the word and leaving an awesome review. 